Meanwhile, back in the 1950s. If a person consistently reads and advocates the views expressed in a communist publication, he may be a communist. Hollywood land was officially struck with the poisonous fear of communism. Trumbo gave you back the finger. That's not... You're not asking the question. I was. Arthur Miller wrote a play about witches. And John Wayne tracked down commies on the beaches of Hawaii. Even Uncle Walt got in the action and named a bunch of names. I believe at that time that Mr. Sorrell was a communist because of all the things that I had heard. It was like the cooties, except a lot of people lost their jobs. And UPA had cause for alarm. After all, these were the same lefties who took part in the Disney strikes and made their first films for a bunch of unions. In late 1950, the anti-communist newsletter Counterattack alleged that the studio had supported various communist organizations over the years, including the International Workers' Order. And at the height of the Red Scare, Columbia Pictures, UPA's longtime distributor, issued a list of eight UPA employees, each who possessed commie connections, and each who were immediately required to denounce communism and cleanse their souls or risk termination. Seven of the eight complied, but John Hubley, who at one time had been an active member of the Communist Party, outrightly refused. On May 31st, 1952, he was fired. It was the slow beginning of UPA's end. And who says, I will protect another general who protects communists is not fit to wear that uniform. <laughs> There's a central figure we haven't yet discussed in the story of UPA, a figure present all throughout the company's grand rise and tragic downfall. The elderly, nearsighted, Jim Bacchus voiced Mr. Magoo. Which way to uh, Hodgepodge Lodge? Can't you read the sign? Well, certainly I can read the sign. What does it say? First introduced as a side character in UPA's third film, The Ragtime Bear, Magoo won over audiences from the get-go, completely upstaging the film's titular main character. Hold on. I told you to quit it. Now, give me that mandolin. Get yourself a new coat. You're disgraceful, son. I'd like you to see neat boy. Oh, I tell you, by George. <laughs> Gerald got four films, Christopher and Pete Hothead both two, but Columbia practically demanded an ongoing series for its rising star, and UPA, obviously eyeing the financial stability that such a series could bring, was happy to oblige. Well, if you don't know, just say so. Just don't stand it like a bag of cement, boy. Lame brain, I tell you. I'll find it myself. <laughs> this is the age of nothing, man. Pete Burness took the reins after John Hubley's departure and helmed the majority of the shorts, all of which occupy a sort of middle ground between the realism of Disney's animation and the experimental elasticity of the more radical UPA films. It ought to be along in here someplace. There it is, Unc! What? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. To move any further, though, we have to switch gears for just a moment. Okay, so as heretical as it's likely going to come across to a lot of you, I don't really like the Magoo cartoons. Obviously, that's coming from a contemporary perspective, not from somebody watching in the middle of the 1950s. And I also just tend to be a bit of a contrarian about these things anyway, but regardless, it's weird. I, I like Magoo. I like the character. He's he's fun and he's... He's well-drawn, and Jim Bacchus' voice is great. I like the character. The character works. I just don't like the films that he's in. Magoo's nearsightedness gets him in trouble with the people and the world around him. Wrap everything in cellophane these days. He mistakes this for that and that for this. Right away, right away. I hear you, I hear you. It's Never sticky, never gummy, dries instantly, even dries underwater. No, 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 out! Antics ensue. 1609. I'll never forget a number. Uh, 19th floor, please. Trouble brews. <laughs> but it all wraps up nicely in the end. Give me the grip. <laughs> and that's fine for like a couple of films, 
but after the tenth time you've seen it, it's... It's just kind of boring. It's just the same thing over and over and over again with, with slightly different variables. It's interesting, because there are actually a handful of films that, that basically flip that formula. Instead of Magoo causing the conflict of the film, the conflict exists in and of itself. And those, I actually tend to like a little bit better. Now, um, I happen to be in the market for a house. I uh, saw your sign and so forth. Yeah, I'll just take a little look around, eh? Mahogany floors. Yeah, run-down neighborhood. Nice throw rug. Make a lovely show. Yeah, very fetching. But even still, and this probably goes back to the fact that I'm coming at this from a contemporary perspective, they're just not quite enough, you know? They're they're kind of fun, but the the gags are never that great. They're well drawn, but I I definitely prefer the more limited look of UPA's other more experimental films. I should be there about now. I'd better check the old road map. Yeah, make sure now. Yes, sir. Seattle, Washington. Regardless of what you think of him, Magoo stands as something of a bittersweet figure in UPA's history. See, UPA came into their prime at a weird time in animation's history, right at the last gasp of the one real theatrical short, which, even more than feature films, had been the main outlet for all animation efforts since the medium's creation. But like the entire film industry, that changed when this little dude emerged. The arrival and rapid rise of television virtually annihilated the presence of newsreels, travelogues, serials, and animated shorts from movie theater screens. Walt Disney shut down his series of one-reel cartoons in 1956, with MGM following suit the very next year. This is Channel 5, UPA TV. Stay tuned now for Ed Swivet's Homeroom Show, but first a special news bullet. Uh-oh, better have the tubes, Jack Waldo. <laughs> We've got Guppy swimming up Channel 5. The industry was shifting, and UPA's footing was no longer secure. As the one reeler began fading away, UPA responded by refocusing their efforts almost entirely away from their standalone films, and more and more onto the reliably commercial Mr. Magoo. The last real energetic standalone effort being Robert Cannon's 1956 short, The Jaywalker. It all started one day when I saw Charlie Hornswoggle on the other side of the street. <laughs> Suddenly, I realized what I'd done. The blood raced through my veins. I felt tinkly all over. I was a bad pedestrian. After the jaywalker, Cannon tried his hand at a couple of Magoo shorts, but wound up deciding to leave UPA, preferring to produce original content. One can easily make the argument that the more UPA focused on Magoo to remain financially afloat, the lower the quality of their films dropped. A sentiment not at all improved by the fact that by the conclusion of the 1950s, the majority of the studio's creative leads had all slipped away. Robert Cannon left in 1957, Bill Melendez in 55, Jules Ingle in 59, and even longtime Magoo director Pete Burness left in 1958 just before production began on the first of UPA's two feature films, The Hail Mary Pass, 1001 Arabian Nights, which shoehorned its nearsighted icon into the Aladdin legend. Magoo, the magic rug is gonna... I haven't time for no problems now! ...to middling results. What greedy, power-hungry son of Beelzebub owns me now? Despite Magoo's popularity, the film was a box office non-starter, unanimously received as a choppy mess of bits and pieces that proved instantly forgettable. The failure of which cost UPA their distribution contract with Columbia. Arabian Nights' failure put owner Steven Basusta in a rough position with limited options. 
To keep his company alive, he sold it to this man, mogul Henry G. Saperstein. Basusta would remain as chairman of the board, but relinquish all management activity to Saperstein, who arrived with much needed capital, but who gave absolutely zero shits about UPA's artistic ambitions. Saperstein was of the stereotypical Hollywood variety who only understood dollar signs. On day one, he shifted the studio's focus to television, instituting a streamlined production initiative with sharp deadlines that churned out episodes on time, but ones that possessed little creative charm. I'll just stroll around and find me a cute little dancing partner. Hmm, <laughs> a little too baggy. UPA was drained and their two initial series, one starring Magoo and the other a Dick Tracy adaptation, were both canceled after only one season each. Dick Tracy calling Hemlock Holmes, calling Hemlock Holmes. Hemlock here, go ahead, Tracy. Stooge Filler and Mumbles just broke out of the state pen. Finding himself no longer needed or wanted at his own company, Stephen Basusta left UPA in late 1961 while Saperstein thrust the animators back into the world of features for the 1962 Judy Garland headliner, Gay Paris, directed by Abe Levitow and written by Chuck and Dorothy Jones. Ironically, a film about one of the very things the original UPA innovators sought to be divorced from. Cute, talking animals. Musette, Musette, my heart for you is one big throb. Jean time, Jean time, my love for you is formidable. Like Arabian Nights, Gay Paris boasted beautiful background work, but overall was nothing at all to write home about, and wound up a similar box office disappointment. Saperstein fired the remaining staff and sold off nearly all of UPA's assets only briefly contracting work out for a television special in 1970, Uncle Sam Magoo. Why, you should be proud to wear that costume, Quincy Magoo. I have for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years? Oh, come now, that's a pretty long run. It was the last film UPA ever animated. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy, a Yankee Doodle Do or Die. The story of UPA is a story whose ending mirrors its beginning. For the seeds that gave birth to the world of UPA were the exact same that spelled out its doom. For one, the leftist political feelings stirring amongst the animators that instigated the Disney strike in 1941 and led to UPA's creation were beaten down by the McCarthyism of the 50s with John Hubley's firing. But even more so was the fact that UPA's films were so perfectly matched to the form of the theatrical short that they arguably didn't work outside of it. Their six-minute short stories were simultaneously too experimental for television and too small and contained for feature films. In addition, the company's structure itself proved to be something of a double-edged sword. As Adam Abraham put it, for a brief, happy span, Artists, not producers or financiers, were in charge of the creative process. During their prime, Stephen Basusta effectively let his staff operate freely and make the films that they wanted to make. But sustaining such a level of creative autonomy in a long-term sense was never realistic. Artists are not businessmen and businessmen not artists, and both are required for long-term success. The trick for any studio is finding the right balance between the two. But then again, maybe UPA's story ended exactly where it always should have. For despite having only really been in their prime for 10 years, they left behind them a legacy whose influence was both enormous and immediate. Ironically, at the same time that UPA was flopping on television sets, Hanna-Barbera triumphed with their adoption of the same limited animation techniques UPA helped develop. Where are you going with my TV set? One could hardly tune into animation's rise on television without noticing some measure of influence. Huckleberry Hound. Rocky and Bullwinkle. The Pink Panther. But it didn't stop there. 
101 Dalmatians, Yellow Submarine, Gendy Tartakovsky, Craig McCracken, Brad Bird, all impossible to watch without seeing the influence from those commies over at UPA. This was their legacy, one that over half a century on hasn't ceased to be a well of inspiration. These were their films, and this was their story. These were the rebels who made animation grow up. Thank you guys so much for watching. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community for creators with 25,000 classes available in design, business, filmmaking, and so much more. So one of my personal goals for the new year is to work on a few original animated short films. I've got what I think are a couple of pretty good ideas that I'm really interested in exploring. And Skillshare is the platform I'm turning to to help me hone in and further develop those animation skills. If you're particularly interested in filmmaking and animation but don't know where to start, Skillshare is one of the very best places to start, and they're actually one of the most affordable learning platforms out there, with an annual subscription coming in at less than $10 a month. But right now, they're offering a dynamite deal. The first 500 people to sign up will get their first two months completely free. Go to skl.sh slash royalocean7 to sign up today. And with that, Royal Ocean's UPA series comes to a close. I hope you guys enjoyed this final part. I have had so much fun diving into these films and crafting these essays, and the response from you guys has been so wonderful. So thank you for watching and liking and commenting and sharing. It really, truly means the world to me. Guys, I've got a lot of cool things coming on the channel in 2019, and I can't wait to start working on it so that I can share it with you all. I'll see you guys soon.